Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for the afternoon session. Um, so we're going to be live on, on YouTube as well, uh, if you prefer to watch there. So we're going to have some exciting talks this afternoon and starting, uh, Henry will tell us about Prio. So Henry is an assistant professor of EENCS at MIT. He did his PhD at Stanford with Dan Bonnet, and then he moved on to be a postdoc at uh, EPFL. And his work has really influenced um, actual real life systems. So the work um, that he's, the systems that he designed with his co-authors um, are now in, in iOS and Android and, and Firefox and have also um, influenced standards, NIST standards and the IETF standards. So as I said today, he's going to tell us about Prio, which is a system to collect aggregate statistics in a privacy preserving way. So Henry, you're up. Great. Thanks so much for the, the invitation to speak here. I'm, I'm, uh, as I mentioned to Benny, I'm like so sad I wasn't able to be there in person. So I'm hoping that, uh, that next year, I was actually so sad that I, um, I decided to make a hummus dinner last night, which was, uh, I, yeah, it turns out uh, I'm a better computer scientist than I am a cook, uh, unfortunately. But good. Um, the other thing is I can't see any of you, so I hope I guess, Rahul, I'm going to rely on you to uh, channel the emotions of the, the audience and laugh at all of my jokes as we go. Yeah, good. So I'm, uh, as more mentioned, I am going to talk a little bit about applications of some of the tools that you've seen already, but I'm going to take a pretty broad view of it. And I, the way I wanted to break down these two parts of the talk is in the first part, I'll cover um, sort of one of the interesting challenges that comes up in practice and that also has some kind of nice tools associated with it, which is how do you protect against misbehavior in applications of these FSS techniques that Elliot mentioned and also kind of secret sharing protocols based on secret sharing. Um, so the motivating application I'll talk about is, is private analytics and I'll, I'll explain what that is. And then the two tools that I'll cover are uh, is sketch verification schemes, which is kind of, you should think of it as like, how do you test properties on secret shared data? And zero knowledge proofs on secret shared data, which are which is um, kind of a more powerful tool that has a bunch of other applications. So in the first part, I'm going to give this kind of simple application, then in a couple of tools, and in the second part, um, I'll talk about you know uh, a wider array of applications. What privacy problems can we solve once we have these these tools built up? Um, and I don't know that it's going to be one hour and one hour. The first part might might take a little bit more than an hour, and the second might take a little bit less. But basically, I don't uh, care what we get through as long as everyone is learning stuff and, and having fun and asking questions. Um, and I, I should say also that, that most of the work that I'll talk about, at least um, the new work, is with uh, Dan Bonnet, Alette Boyle, Nivigo Boyle, and Yuval Ishai. And then I'll mention related work as I go along. Um, but please forgive me if I omit some. Um, I'll do my best to, to cover all the citations. So good. Um, and I guess I, I should say the other reason um, I don't usually present with a whiteboard like this, but because this is a, a supposed to be a winter school, I thought I'd take a more uh, uh, a less traditional approach to doing this. So I hope it I hope it works and that you can read my my messy handwriting. So good. Uh, so let me talk about one application um, of the tools that uh, that we'll see later today, and. Um, this has a bunch of names, sometimes called private aggregation, sometimes private analytics, sometimes, um, you know, this Prio system is kind of an instantiation of this. And this is a very, an idea that, you know, I don't even know where to attribute it to because it's been around for so long in so many different forms, um, certainly going back to, 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 say, the 80s. And let me give you the problem and then, and then sort of the, 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 the simple way to solve it and why the simple way is not sufficient. So the kind of example application, um, and this is related to one of the, the real world applications that I've worked on, is that Mozilla, which is the company that makes the Firefox browser, web browser, wants to know uh, something about it, the users of the Firefox web browser. So for example, Mozilla might want to know uh, which web pages in the, say, Alexa top, top 10,000 list of web pages are popular home pages. Um, so, for example, they might want to know this because they might want to optimize the browser to work better on the popular home pages. They might want to know, uh, you know, demographic information about their users, what their users like and dislike. There's a bunch of reasons why they might want to answer this question. 
So the way this would work uh, with sort of a non-private scheme uh, is, let's call this non-private analytics, is that you have a bunch of users. There's say, uh, you know, probably tens of millions or hundreds of millions of Firefox users. And Mozilla runs some data collection service. And everyone just sends their homepage to Mozilla. So your browser phones home periodically and sends back to Mozilla um, what your current homepage is at, for, at the moment. So maybe this is Alice, and Alice's homepage is uh, nytimes.com. And this is Bob, and Bob's homepage is cnn.com, and so on. So you know, from a privacy perspective, this is problematic because obviously, you know, Mozilla now is a single point of, of privacy failure, right? So the data can get stolen in a data breach, you know, uh, data breach, or maybe, I don't know, what, uh, what, uh, what else could happen? There could be some kind of mass surveillance program that convinces Mozilla to turn over the data, or Mozilla could decide to resell it, you know, so this is uh, surveillance, uh, resale, you know, use your data in a way that you didn't want. So, so the basic problem here uh, with this kind of setup, the non-private setup, is that uh, you know Mozilla learns more than it needed. It, in particular, it learns everyone's homepage. Uh, homepage, right? When they just wanted this aggregate statistic, they just wanted to know which homepages are popular homepages. But instead, they learned a lot more information than the, than was strictly necessary. So. The goal of these kinds of private analytics systems is to allow a company like Mozilla to compute the aggregate statistics of interest without kind of learning any individual users' uh, private data. Yeah, because if you think about the function that Mozilla is trying to compute, they don't actually need to learn Alice or Bob's homepage to, to um, to compute the statistic necessarily, maybe with a more uh, clever protocol, we could do this um, without this privacy failure. Okay, are there any questions on the, the setup so far? Okay, um, cool. Okay, so this is just one use case. Um, and please, please, please ask questions if things are unclear. I hope that you do as we go along. So, so um, let me just mention some of the use cases for these kinds of, of tools. So I mentioned that Mozilla, um, is interested in um, browser telemetry data. This is actually kind of a pilot program using, using this, the tools I'll describe as in use today. Um, Apple and Google, uh, Google are using it for measuring um, the effectiveness of the um, exposure notification apps for uh, COVID-19. So gathering, it's similar kind of telemetry applications where they want to know how well, you know, uh, if you see an exposure notification on your phone, do you call the phone number or do you not call the phone number? That's private information, but they'd like to learn aggregate statistics about what people are doing in general. And then more recently, there's been a lot of interest in, from online, uh, online ad companies that are trying to kind of develop more privacy-friendly ways to measure the behavior of users as they browse the internet and look at ads or not. So... Yeah, and I'd say there's even more of these that uh, that I don't know about. I'm, I'm I'm learning about as we go. So I guess one thing that I want you to take away before you even see any of the tools is that kind of this is an area in which um, protocol improvements um, can end up uh, end up in use very quickly. You know, within within uh, a year or so, you can go from having a new idea, a new technical idea, to someone implementing it and using it in a product. So, um, I guess this is super exciting to me as a as a computer scientist, as someone interested in cryptography, because this doesn't happen that often. It often takes thirty years for something to to show up in practice, and this is a place where kind of um, it seems like the demand for these tools really exceeds the supply. So, as a student working on uh, deciding what to work on, I hope that you think about. This is an area, um, an area where you could potentially have a lot of impact. So, okay, let me, um, if there's no, are there any questions? Uh, none so far. Okay, okay. Uh, at, at a certain point soon, I'm gonna pause and wait until there is a question because I, I just wanna get, get people uh, thinking and talking, but, but I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you think about what questions you wanna ask and then uh, come back in a minute. So, okay, here's the, 
the basic scheme, I'm going to give kind of a basic protocol uh, for private analytics that's uh, sort of OK, but not good enough. So I'll explain why it's sort of OK, and then we'll talk about how to make it uh, better. And you may have seen this. This will not be uh, earth shattering to many of you, um, but uh, I just want to get us all on the same page. OK, so the basic idea is that we're going to have um, two or more servers store uh, some kind of database in secret shared form. So the first uh, you know, kind of annoying thing is we're going to need now two or more servers. So instead of just Mozilla, we're going to have, say, a couple of data collection servers. But uh, you know, we can talk about how you actually instantiate this in practice, but that's kind of the important, important caveat. But once we have this set up, uh, what it allows us to do is have the clients kind of write their secret data into this database uh, without revealing uh, where or what they're writing. And this may uh, make you think of function secret sharing or distributed point functions, and that's uh, that's a that's exactly right. This is one of the tools we use for this. So throughout um, throughout basically the rest of this uh, this talk, I'll use uh, I'll say that all all arithmetic is in a finite field uh, that I'll call f. And what you should uh, what you should think of as is f as being the int module of some I don't know 80 bit prime. So if you prefer, think of everything as mod p. Uh, but just to keep the the notation concise, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this uh, f to in indicate arithmetic mod p. Okay, so now with this setup, let me explain how the system works. So remember, the problem is we have a bunch of clients here, a bunch of web browsers. Each has a home page, and these data collection servers over here. I'm just gonna write two servers, but in practice, there could be more than two. Um, server A and server B. And the servers want to know what are the popular home pages for each uh, you know for each of the Alexa top 10,000 home pages, how many clients have that uh, that as a home page. So the way this is going to work is that each of these servers holds uh, sort of starts out at the beginning of the day with a big vector of integers initialized to all zeros. Um, let me write it like this. Uh, that space. Um, so big vector of integers initialized to all zeros. And this database is going to be secret shared in the sense that if you add up these two shares of the database that the servers have, you get a uh, kind of a logical database that at the beginning of the day is initialized to all zeros. So each server is holding an additive secret sharing of the kind of logical database. And each entry in this logical database is going to say, uh, sort of the first entry is the number of clients, uh, clients who have, uh, you know, website number one as their homepage. And the second entry here is the number of clients that have website number two and number three and so on for all of the uh, 10,000 10, uh, Alexa top 10,000 home pages or 10,000 web pages. Cool. So then, uh, given this setup, the clients can send kind of secret shared database updates to write or update the state of this database without revealing anything to the servers about where their update is happening. So in particular, say this first client here has, uh, you know, the second home page is uh, is his. So so say this first one corresponds to I don't know, I'll write it over here. Say this corresponds to uh, you know the New York Times being your home page, and this one corresponds to CNN being your home page, and this client has CNN as his home page. So what this client will do is take this big vector, split it into uh, two secret shares. So split it into two, two vectors that are each individually gonna look random. So this is gonna look like, I don't know, whatever, uh, random numbers. And 
random numbers here, such that when you add up these two things, they're equal to, to the client's uh, original vector. And then the client's going to send one of these shares to each of the two servers. So it'll send this share to server A and this share to server B. And what the server is going to do is just going to add the client share into its this kind of accumulator that it has running. So it's going to add, you know, now the state after this update will be whatever it is. And the server, second server will do the same thing. So, and once this happens, you'll see that the kind of logical state of the database is still all zeros, except there's a one in the in the position of the um, the the kind of client's update. So if this client had a one in the second uh, the second index in its vector, then this logical database state now has a one. In it. And the rest of the clients can do this over the course of the rest of the day. And as each client kind of makes an update, this logical database will have, you know, I don't know, the numbers here will increase. And, and, um, and eventually this secret shared vector down here, logical database state will incorporate the home pages of all the clients. So uh, this is kind of almost all the way there. So what happens? Um, what happens next? Kind of the last step is let me erase this stuff. So the last step is that the servers at the end of the day um, basically publish the contents of these their accumulators, and by adding up these um, their two accumulators, they can reconstruct kind of the state of the database and the aggregate statistics that they wanted. So whatever whatever it would be. So I'm going to pause for questions in one second, but before we do that, let me just uh, kind of summarize what we have so far. So, so this simple, simple private analytics scheme. So, so far. So what did this simple scheme do? So, so I guess the first property that I want you to observe is that uh, the simple scheme is actually, is actually simple. Simple in the sense that it's easy to implement. Right, there was no fancy crypto happening here at all. There's no, you know, barely any crypto going on at all. It's just uh, additions and subtractions, a very, very small number of them, and it's concretely efficient. So that's good. It, as long as, say, the number of websites is not too big. So I said the Alexa top 10,000, not the Alexa top billion websites. So as long as these numbers are not huge, things are okay. The second property is it's actually correct in the sense that the, the servers get the right answer. So the servers actually, um, if everyone does the right thing, so the clients do the right thing, the servers do the right thing, everybody follows the protocol, the servers get exactly um, the aggregate uh, statistics uh, that they want. So they learn exactly how many clients had CNN.com as their homepage. And the last property, which is kind of the whole, the whole point of this uh, system, is it uh, satisfies this uh, useful privacy notion, which is that a malicious server, if one of the two servers is malicious, it uh, learns nothing uh, in, a, in a specific sense about uh, the, any client's data, data or the clients, you know, in this case, the data is the client's homepage apart from what it can infer from the uh, statistics themselves. So, so what I mean uh, in, in a little bit, um, a little bit more precision is that kind of, a, you know, for all inputs, if we think of the, the client's inputs as being x1 up to um, xc, so the c clients. And for all uh, adversaries that control, say, one of the two servers, there is a simulator that, that, um, such that when you run the simulator on, and there's like public parameters of the system that I'm, that I'm skipping, but basically the view um, of, say, one of the two servers, view of server A in this execution uh, with uh, client inputs x1 up to xc is uh, looks the same as the simulator when it's given um, only the aggregate statistic of interest. Where here, this this aggregate statistic 
would be kind of the you know number of clients that had each of the home pages. So already, even though we haven't really done much work, this is a seems like a useful private aggregation scheme. So let me pause for questions here. Can I get get one? Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Great. The first one is um, the goal here sounds very similar to the goal of differential privacy. So, is there any uh, performance reason or you know some other reason uh, to use this approach instead of uh, differential privacy? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. So, whenever you hear privacy, I think most of us think of differential privacy first, and the difference is a bit uh, subtle. So, I think one way to think about it is. Um, yeah, so so I guess the way I think about it, there's kind of two things, two things, two things you need to do when you're designing a protocol. The first is is uh, what's the privacy goal you're trying to achieve, and the second is how are you going to achieve it. So think of you know you're going on a trip. First question is where are you driving to, and the second question is how do you build the car that gets you there, or how do you drive the car? And differential privacy is really about what's the goal. Um, what's the privacy property that we're going to aim for? And so you can actually, uh, whereas this kind of stuff, private private aggregation stuff, is really about the mechanism by which you compute some function. So to say it again in different words, differential privacy is asking which functions are safe functions to compute, right? Because what we said here is the only thing that leaks is this is this uh, this statistics that we're computing, but maybe the statistics we're computing are too leaky. And differential privacy is a way to reason about that. Um, whereas this, this is just uh, giving you a recipe for computing certain types of functions. So let me say it uh, again, slightly differently. It, what you can do is actually modify this type of system to provide differential privacy. In addition to this, this is kind of a multi-party computation type of privacy definition. If you if you want if you care about differential privacy, you can layer this on top. But the two kind of concepts are really, I would say, to the most part, orthogonal. I'm not sure if that was clear, but uh... okay. Uh, another question: Is there any way to prevent? from users to ruin the database by pushing wrong data into each server? Ah, fantastic question. Okay, so this is this is exactly what uh, what we're gonna spend um, the rest of the time talking about. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, answer that question by by uh, going on to the next chunk of material and then we can come back, come back for more. So cool, okay. So, so you know, these are three properties, they're all useful, but maybe they're not enough properties. Uh, so in particular, um, is the person asking the question points out, it, so one malicious client uh, client can completely corrupt uh, the computation. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see how that works. Right. Um, we have these uh, clients here. You know, our millions of clients, and say one of them is is adversarial. So. What the client was supposed to do is it has, we have these two servers, server B, and the client was supposed to send a secret sharing of a vector that's kind of uh, zero everywhere, except a one in, in a single location, but a client could do something malicious, like it could send a, you know, a zero everywhere except 15 in a particular location. It splits its vector into secret shares and sends one of these shares to each of the servers. The servers have this uh, this database state that they're holding. This uh, this kind of malformed request here that the client sent, it looks you know by the property of the secret sharing scheme looks fine to the servers. There's no way for the servers to tell that this kind of attack is in progress. But when the servers kind of update their database state, um, what's going to happen is that the logical database is going to get it incremented by uh, 15 instead of by one. Yeah. So one malicious client can cause kind of uh, undue influence uh, influence uh, on the output. And in particular, it can get much worse than this, right? The client can, can uh, put uh, you know, a million in here, or it could even put negative a million, or it could put uh, random garbage in all of these entries, right? Uh, and what, basically, whatever the client does here is going to show up down here. So, so one client can really destroy the... Um, the computation. And even worse than that is if you follow through what's going on here, at the end of the day, the servers don't actually know who to blame. 
um, because the privacy of the, the scheme actually protects the, the privacy of the adversarial clients as well. So um, in the kind of the rest of this hour, uh, this hour, and um, I might actually steal a little bit from myself for the next hour, we're going to talk about how to defend um, defend against uh, malicious clients in 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 this type of setting. And you know, I should be a little bit more precise, but uh, let me let me put an asterisk here by saying that the real goal is to do this without paying too much. Um, too much. Because if you've learned about, say, multi-party computation, secure multi-party computation, or other you know, zero-knowledge proofs, other techniques, it turns out that if you don't care about efficiency, you can do basically anything you want. And, but if you actually want to deploy these systems at scale, you have to care a lot about the concrete efficiency. So the tools that I'm going to talk about today are, based, are all about defending against malicious clients without paying too much for it. Um, so it, I'll give a couple examples of this. I guess the one thing I want to say um, is that that once you start talking about uh, malicious security, everything gets messy. So um, everything gets messy, everything gets complicated, everything gets difficult, right? So, so in particular, let me try to convince you that this is true. So, so we've already talked about kind of, um, I guess the security properties we're looking at here were kind of, if everyone does the right thing, then everyone gets the right answer. And the privacy property was saying, if one of the servers is kind of following the protocol, but um, I guess I, I mentioned malicious here, but say semi-honest security. So one of, one of the servers, uh, the adversary corrupts one of the servers, but does the right thing. It doesn't learn too much information. When you're talking about malicious security, you have to answer a lot more questions, right? So, so um, uh, are you worried about, um, so malicious clients, only or malicious clients and servers or just servers? And how are you defining an attack? So do you care about uh, uh, clients? You know, I talked about clients corrupting the output, but do you care about servers corrupting the output? Or maybe you only care about Servers breaking, uh, servers breaking privacy. You don't care about servers corrupting the output. Or you know, there's basically a bunch of different flavors of malicious security that you can look at. Um, today, just to keep our discussion kind of constrained, I'm going to look at I would say kind of the simplest one, which is the servers are doing the right thing and the client is is trying to mess up the output. But um, in some of the papers I'll mention there's different flavors of malicious security that pop up and uh, different tools are needed to, to address each of those. Um, I will say that sort of a, usually when there's a bug in uh, one of one of the things I've done, it's usually relating to malicious security. So I'd say for me, at least this is the most subtle, subtle piece of uh, what's going on here. So, okay, maybe I'll pause here for questions again, um, just to see if there's anything else. No? Okay. Cool. So before I dive in, I just want to say, um, again, for those of you who are familiar with multi-party computation, you might be thinking, well, you know, what is new here? You can use kind of general purpose, say, malicious secure multi-party computation to solve many of these problems. Um, and I think the, the, the point I hope to drive home today is that um, in certain applications, we can get uh, kind of efficiency gains over general purpose, uh, say multi-party computation, by exploiting uh, two things. So the first thing that's good to exploit is that in many of these cases, the computations uh, we need to do are either simple simple or structured. And this is sort of one way you can get an advantage over general purpose tools. And the other way is that in, in many of these cases, the client um, 
knows the entire input. Um, and can kind of, uh, I should say, the client knows her entire input and can somehow help the servers uh, to do something. So this is vague, but um, I guess in the normal setting of multi-party computation, every party knows their own input, but doesn't know anything about the other party's inputs. Whereas here, there's kind of one party that knows the entire input in question. So if we go back to this, this picture, um, yeah, so I guess I erased it. Yeah, so okay. So this client, if it weren't malicious, um, knows its entire input, and the servers kind of want to check something on the secret shared input. Each of the servers only has one share, but the client knows everything. And somehow we can exploit that to get efficiency gains, um, even if the client might be malicious. So let me give um, kind of what I think is the simplest example of this, of how to do this in this private anal analytics scheme, protect against malicious clients. It's simple and yet it's non-trivial and it's, it's super useful. Um, so this is how to protect uh, the private analytics uh, from malicious clients. And the goal is to ensure that each client can only uh, say vote once. So one client, one vote. So each client only has gets to have one homepage and they each only get to vote once and they can't mess up the computation uh, apart from you know, picking their homepage to be whatever they want it to be. So this is, there's a, a really nice way to do this that is um, from this 2016 of Elet, uh, Niv, and Yuval. And the basic idea is to have the uh, servers check that each client submission is well formed uh, before accepting it. And if not, just uh, you know, if not, just ignore. So if a client tries to mess up the computation, just ignore whatever the client says. So let me kind of try to say this in a little bit more detail. So the honest clients uh, send shares, send secret sharings of a vector. So call this shares XA and XB for servers XA and X, uh, servers A and B. And these are vectors of dimension N. Uh, whose sum, so xa plus xb, is uh, an all zero vector with, say, at most one, one in it. So uh, uh, at most, there's at most one home page in this, in this vector. And the servers want to check this property basically without communicating too much and without messing up uh, the client's privacy, right? So one way the servers could actually check if you didn't care about privacy, the servers could just basically exchange their shares of these vectors, which would recover the client's, the client's private data and check that it's well formed, but that would mess up privacy. So we want to somehow execute this check without uh, messing up privacy. So the picture of the way this is going to look is that the client sends its shares, uh, so this XA to one server and XB to the other server, and the servers are going to interact. So if this is server A, and server B, the servers are going to interact and then either um, sort of accept or reject. Cool. Any questions about this uh, so far? Any more? All right, I'll keep going then. So this is um, the way we can solve this is with what's called a sketch uh, ver verification scheme. And the scheme, I'll, I'll describe the properties that we wanted to satisfy and then explain how we actually implement it. Um, but the, the basic idea is that the servers uh, hold additive shares 
of a vector, uh, some vector x. And the sketch verification scheme is defined relative to a language uh, L that's say a subset of the dimension n vectors in this, in this uh, finite field. So here for our application, this language is going to be kind of the, the set of uh, vectors with at most one one. So these are kind of the valid inputs that a client could have. And the sketch verification scheme, we wanted to satisfy um, sort of three properties. So completeness, soundness, and some kind of privacy or honest verifiers or knowledge. So what does completeness mean? Uh, this should be familiar to you if you've seen um, proof systems before, but this is a slightly different setting since there's sort of two servers, two independent verifiers. So what completeness means is that if the client's input uh, is kind of well formed, it's it's uh, you know um, in this language that we care about, then honest server should accept. If X is ill-formed, so the client sends some garbage, then honest servers uh, reject, say with high probability. And the privacy property says that if X is is well formed, then uh, you know a an adversarial say an adversarial server uh, executing the protocol correctly you know learns nothing about X learns nothing about X except uh, you know that X is in the language and uh, I don't think well okay uh, so basically what you what what the the, the the way you define this formally is to say that there's um, a, you know exists a simulator such that for all inputs that are in the language the view of the um, the view of the adversarial server on the inputs um, you know x a and x b uh, can be simulated without access to the input itself. So what this is saying is that if you run you know you run this protocol. The adversary only can see the see into the brain of one of these servers. The adversary doesn't learn anything about X, the client's input, apart from the fact that it's it's well formed. Um, so cool. So that's the that's the kind of the syntax of what we're trying to do. Um, let me now explain how how you actually do it. So let me give this this protocol, and this is this BGI sixteen one. And this is for checking that, that some input X that's secret shared among the servers is in the language of uh, you know, vectors that are all zero with at most one, one. And say this finite field is big enough, I don't know, big 80-bit uh, 80, 80 finite field. So the way this protocol works um, is as follows. So what the servers do is they first agree on uh, two random vectors. So the first one I'll call little r, and that's just n random field elements. And the second one I'll call big R, which is just each element of little r uh, squared, kind of component-wise. So the servers could agree on these in practice, they would say agree on a, a PRG seed and then use the seed to generate a bunch of randomness. Um, but it doesn't really matter how the servers derive these random values. That's step one. The second thing that the servers do is they compute um, what I'll call test values. Test values. And what these test values are, are kind of a succinct uh, a sketching of the this big input X that the, that the servers are holding secret shares of. So if I'll write it like this. So we have server A over here and server B over here. And server A holds uh, this share XA and server B holds this share XB. What the servers are going to do is each compute two test values. So I'll call little t 
to be um, the inner product of X, A, and R. And big T will be the inner product of X, A, and big R. So these are just single field elements. And the same for server B. So this is uh, X, B, and R. And this is X, B, and big R. And if you look at it, uh, so I guess I'm using this inner product notation. Um, if you haven't seen it, so when I say um, this means the sum of xi, uh, ri, uh, in f. So this is just notation for the inner products. So if you look at what's, what's going on here, um, what TA, little TA, and little TB are, are they're just additive secret shares of the value, the inner product of the client's input and little r. And these are secret shares of the client's input and big R. And the last step, um, which may not be uh, uh, completely obvious, but it, it is the following. So we'll use a constant size uh, multi party computation protocol to check the following relation. So they're gonna check that little ta plus little tb squared minus uh, big ta, big tb, uh, that this thing is equal to zero. And I claim that if the client is honest, if, if x is in this language, that this check will pass. And if the client is dishonest and X is not in this language, then this check will always fail. So rather than having to do these inputs, the, in, the client's input could actually be quite big. This, this uh, N could be you know, 10,000 or 100,000 different uh, uh, counters that the client might be incrementing or not. And we've reduced this all using this kind of sketching technique to a constant size multi-party computation, which can be done by exchanging, I don't know, 100 bytes or so on between the, between the servers. So um, before I argue that this actually does what we want, I'll just point out that the communication here is super small. So it's a sort of a constant number of uh, field elements uh, per server, independent uh, of the input size n. And the computation is also super small. So it's kind of a linear number of uh, field operations. Uh, per server uh, with no kind of hidden scary constants. And so I, I should say, I guess here, if, if uh, you know, accept the server is accepted, so. So any, any questions about the protocol before I keep going? Um, there's one question where um, someone asked that why honest verifier zero knowledge is sufficient when we consider mal malicious party? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for the purposes of this talk so far, um, I'm thinking of the clients as being malicious and the servers as being semi-honest. Semi-honest. Uh, yeah. What one more question I have is that, mm -hmm. um, uh, what if instead of vote being zero or one, like vote being one, we have vote being some value alpha? How would this just be modified? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, good, good, good. So you're saying we want to allow votes to not just be zero, one, but we want to allow votes to be zero, one, two, three, or four. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 So this is a good question. Maybe I will come back to that shortly, um, but it's possible to do. Okay. This is a great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I'll come back to this in a second. That is, that is a great one. Any, any others that I should uh, address before I go? Uh, no. Okay, cool. So, right. So with the sketch verification, the servers uh, can't, uh, the malicious clients can't mess up the computation. So I don't have time to give kind of the full analysis, but let me, uh, so let me sorry, just, just one more question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this protocol a specific case for distributed zero knowledge? And this is, you can think of it, so I'll talk in a, in a second about um, sort of zero knowledge proofs on distributed or secret shared data. And that's much more similar. I think here the distinction, at least between um, 
sort of the normal setting that I've seen of distributed zero knowledge is there's not really a prover here because there's no proof. Uh, so this is kind of the thing that distinguishes these sketching schemes from zero knowledge proof style systems is that in a, in a proof, proof system, there has to be a proof. And here there's actually no proof. It's just uh, sort of a, a lightweight computation. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe when, when, we, when we talk about proofs on secret shared data, the, the distinction will become even more uh, crisp. So yeah. So, <laughs> well, okay. Let me just say, uh, explain why completeness works. So the servers are essentially testing whether the inner product of X and little r squared and the inner product of X and big R is equal to zero. So this is the test that the servers are doing. And if, if, um, if there's only one kind of non-zero component in this vector X, this is gonna be equal to um, Ri squared. So that say the non-zero component is the ith one. It's gonna be Ri squared minus Ri squared is equal to zero, and then that will be that check will pass. It's um, a soundness is not that much more difficult to see. Um, you apply kind of the Schwartz Zippo lemma in the usual way, and this the um, the soundness error is something like two over the size of the field. Um, so I won't give the arguments here. And then the privacy um, against a semi honest. Uh, servers, and this is this is uh, this is important that they're actually this only holds if the servers execute the protocol correctly. Is also pretty straightforward. The servers don't actually learn anything. If you see what the servers learn, um, it's just the output of this test. And the output of this test, if the client is honest, is always uh, kind of one. The output of the test is always accept. So privacy is also relatively straightforward. So I'll mention. Um, uh, so extensions, I guess I don't have time to, to go into all of them, but um, I would say maybe, yeah, maybe the answer for this is, is check out this uh, Boyle Gabor Shai uh, 2016 paper from CCS. They talk about both, you know, if the field has a characteristic two, the test I showed doesn't work. So there's extensions there. They also talk about different extensions when, um, you want to sketch for different properties. So maybe the client can have a one, a zero, or a negative one in a particular index, or like you were asking, the client can have any arbitrary value, but only at a, at a single index, um, or there's a whole variety of, of um, clever tricks that you can use to, to sketch for more interesting predicates. So I'll point you to that paper if you're interested. Um, cool. Okay, so we have you know maybe 10-ish minutes. So in the remainder of the time, um, let's see what I want to do. Yeah, so maybe I'll wrap up sketching and then I'll use the first part of the next uh, the next hour to talk about um, uh, zero knowledge proofs on secret shared data and then and then applications. So okay, so um, one thing that I want you to be wary of um, in this protocol and when you're thinking about your own systems that you're building. Um, are these things called uh, selective failure attacks. And these come up all over the place. I, I think first in you know, multi-party computation context, they, they definitely come up um, as BGI 16 pointed them out in this case. But um, the point is that the simple sketching scheme, uh, simple sketching, uh, does not protect uh, client privacy against a malicious server. And yeah, so so let me explain why why that is and how you can protect against it. Um, so the attack that a malicious server can run, and this is kind of a general attack that applies. So if you're designing a system and you're you're trying to protect, say, against malicious parties, you should always be thinking of this, this type of attack. Um, is what the malicious server can do, say the malicious server suspects that your homepage is CNN.com and it wants to check that its guess is correct. So what the malicious server will do is it guesses, um, guesses the location 
of the you know client's uh, non-zero entry. So this is effectively guessing which home page the server thinks that you have. And it is sort of adds an offset uh, to its secret share uh, that kind of shifts the non-zero uh, zero entry somewhere else. So let me draw a picture. So this is the client. The client has sent the servers um, shares of a vector and say the clients, so this is a set of shares are XA and XB. And if you add up these shares, they should be, they're equal to, um, you know, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Yeah. So if this server is malicious, this is a server, say server A is malicious. What it can do is it can, it can add some offset to its secret share. So now it's working with X A plus Delta and the offset it's gonna add is kind of negative one and then a one somewhere else. So what this is gonna do to the effective uh, value of this, this secret share is it's gonna make it you know, look like that. So that's happened. So this is if, if, you're, if the guess is correct, uh, this is what's gonna happen. If the guess is incorrect, something else is going to happen. So say your homepage was actually here. Now, once the server shifted the shares, it's going to look like this, something like this. So this is guess incorrect. Yeah. So the server shifts the, the location of the non-zero uh, entry according to its guess, and then it just runs the rest of the protocol. Uh, the sketching scheme Honestly, yeah. So what's going to happen is if the server's guess is correct, then the protocol will actually accept, and the server will know that it guessed correctly. It'll know that your homepage is CNN.com. If the server's guess is incorrect, then the sketching protocol will reject, and and it's going to say, oh, but this client's input's ill-formed, and then the server will know that your homepage is not CNN.com. So you know this is only one bit of leakage, but it's kind of an important bit. Right, depending on what, uh, in many applications, one bit of leakage is enough to uh, uh, cause serious problems. And of course, over time, you can turn one bit of leakage into as many bits of leakage as you want. So this is, I guess, something something to to be careful of when you're designing these type of protocols. You know, you need to make them simple, but then not too simple. So um, I'll just uh, wrap up uh, the hour by saying, without going into the details, uh, so recent work. And this is um, this is at IEEE Security and Privacy uh, with um, a, all the co-authors I mentioned on the, at the beginning of the talk. So extends uh, the sketching idea uh, to provide malicious security, like security against uh, malicious servers. I should say, maybe I'll say like, to protect client privacy. Uh, privacy. And the basic idea that, um, that follows, um, you know, lots of work um, in, the, in the malicious secure MPC world um, is, is the following. So instead of the client just sending um, it, it's secret shared, uh, secret shared vector. What the client is going to do is it's going to send its secret shared vector, but then it's going to send kind of some authenticated version of it. So it's going to pick a random value and it's going to kind of, you can think of this as macking the uh, non-zero location of its vector with a secret, a secret Mac key. So this is kind of an information theoretic Mac. So the client sends X and then K times X for some scalar, secret scalar K that the client picks. And then the server sends, or the client sends to each of the servers now shares of X and shares of K times X.
And then there's some more complicated sketching protocol that the servers run um, that kind of simultaneously checks that the client's input is well formed and that this Mac is computed correctly. And why is that helpful? Well, it's helpful that because if one of the servers tampers with the client's input, this Mac check will always fail and the servers will no, learn no information about the client's, uh, the client's secret value. So, so I'm not gonna be able to go into all the details on this. I'll just say, you know, see the paper, see the paper for the details. And um, I guess just keep in mind that you should be super careful about, uh, you know, who, who um, malicious security if you're, if you're using these types of systems. So, okay, let me pause and take a couple of questions and then we can, we can go to the break. Any, any remaining ones? Uh, so there's one question. Can't a malicious server also just use incorrect values of R while uh, when doing sketch check and thus learn whether the input come from an arbitrary set of all websites instead of just checking for one specific one? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, <clears throat> you could say, okay, um, you know, what happens here if, if the um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of a succinct example of this, but you could imagine that the, I don't know, the servers pick R, a malicious server picks R to be, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 or something like this. Um, some funny, funny value like this, it's not actually random. And then maybe you worry that there's some privacy problem that pops out at the end. Um, so the reason why that's not a problem. Okay, so first is you need to come up with some means by which the servers agree on these random vectors and these vectors better be random. Um, but that's actually, a, a, the randomness of the vectors is actually only important uh, for soundness because basically each, each, um, you see the best way to say this, but basically the honest server and the malicious server are going to be computing the same function of the um, this this client secret shared data, and tampering with the randomness here because of this check at the end, it, because this check at the end is done in a kind of multi-party computation, is not going to let the, the the servers learn anything about the clients. Um, uh, the the client's private data, apart from kind of whether it's valid or not. Uh, not sure that was terribly convincing, but um, yeah, I think I think the thing to do is if you actually walk through the security analysis, you'll see that 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 kind of attack is not going to be helpful. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no. That's cool. It. Cool, cool, cool. So I guess we'll come back in in 15 minutes. And so I'll cover the last piece I wanted to talk about about this and then maybe take 20 minutes on that and then spend the rest of the time on applications.